Hey, T-Bear. Hiya. Hey, there we go. T-Bear, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. I have to apologize for my faux pas. You're all good. You're... My mistake. It, ha I'm... it happens. We're, we're here now. We're chatting, right? So we're, we're yeah. all good. I yeah. apologize. Yeah. I've got the sun in my uh, face here, so I'm going to uh, wear glasses today like this. I usually wear them like this, but it's really bright. So. Hey, I'm good. You look pretty cool, so uh, <laughs> I'm good with it. The indoor, in the indoor shades, I think it works, right? You know. So, All right, there you go. It's pretty rock and roll. Yeah. How are you, Steve? I'm good, and I wanted to ask you the same thing. So, how, like, we'll start there, right? Like, how are you holding up through everything that's been going on, 2020, everything we're in right now? Like, uh, just like, how how are you holding up through everything? It's uh, it's been it's been the the hardest. Uh, uh, I guess last this year and last year in 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 my life. I mean, um, you know, 2019 was uh, was devastating for me. I lost my wife to cancer, and um, you know that that really you know kicked my ass in all kinds of ways, spiritually, emotionally. Uh, and then you know this comes down, and uh, you know I, I got a lot of I, I got a lot of uh, you know respite by being able to play music live and going out and enjoy shows by other people, and you know this uh, this just you know shut me down again. And but you know um, I'm, I'm I'm really a spiritual guy, and I, I learned in 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 a way that. Um, you know, there is a plan and there is a reason for things. And, you know, if I look at it that way, you know, I'm always grateful for the things I've been, that I've received or that I've gotten in my life. And, you know, I show a lot of gratitude for that. Um, one of the things I had to, to, to be, to learn actually to, so that I could live in faith and not fear was to be grateful for things that were taken away. And if I could learn how to be grateful for the things that were taken away, um, then, you know, I could have faith that, that there is a plan and, you know, I'm part of the plan, you know, and I'm, and I'm just, you know, I'm just learning. And so, yeah, it's been a, it's been a, a bitch of a year and, uh, you know, on, on so many levels, you know, and, and, you know, but I'm, we're not, you know, we're not, in, we're not alone in this. Everybody is, together in this so it's you know it's no one no one's unscathed really that's the thing right i mean because you know i mean at least in my lifetime right i mean i haven't uh, experienced none of us have experiencing anything like this but to the degree of um something that we're all together in you know yeah. that's the perspective right we, that we need to kind of look at because everybody's got a you know different story this is affecting everybody in a different way right i mean right. there's Personally, I work from home and I have for over a decade, so that's that's not hard. But dealing with distance learning for my kids that that's a bitch and it's a it's a it's a pain. And having to juggle that with you know I mean, split households and fires here in the Bay Area, uh, you know, and and everything else, it's just it's nuts. But everybody is in it. Too. It's what? biblical at this point. I mean, you got fire, you got earthquake, you got flood, you know, you got plague. You know, next is what? You know, frogs, locusts. I mean, there's not a lot left to, <laughs> to tackle it this way, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And so for you, with, you know, first of all, you know, I'm sorry for your loss of your, your wife. I mean, that's, thank you. Thank you. It's got to be really incredibly painful, you know. And so is it from that pain? Is it, you know, or is it kind of the gratitude? Tell me kind of where it came from that you decided to dive back into music after. You know, such actually, a actually, um, it, we have to go back a little ways, and and um, I um, I was in music a long time ago, and I played on a lot of records uh, uh, yeah. that 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 are that are known, and and I had solo albums out and things like that, and I had a pretty popping career, especially over in Europe, and um, you know, I I then met. A woman and and married her and we had three children and spent 20 years together and I got divorced and um, and then you know 
a couple of years later, I moved in with Nina, um, the, the, the woman that, that passed away. And, um, and she said to me, she said, you know, I, I heard about you years ago as, as, being a, as being a musician. And, you know, I know you play because you sit here at the house and there's a piano and you play a lot. So it's time for you to, to actually, um, here, let me shut this phone off. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, it's time for you to, time for you to go out and start playing, you know, like put a band together, you know, go play some gigs, go, you know, do some things. And I said, well, you know, I'm pretty rusty. And she says, you know what, this is what you're meant to do. And, um, so she went back to college, um, in her fifties, um, to get a degree. She'd never graduated college and she came home and would sit at her desk and the piano was on the other side, right at, up, up against her desk. And um, <clears throat> she'd sit at her desk and do her homework. And I'd sit down there and I'd start writing songs. And uh, we did that almost every night. And for, for, the, for the next month or two, all of a sudden, songs were flowing out of me. Everything was, was like coming together. And she said, see, see, this is what you're supposed to do. And uh, and she really kicked me in the ass and she said, you know, it's time. And so I picked up the phone and asked for help. I called all my friends <clears throat> and I said, hey, you know, I wanna record again. I wanna make a record. I wanna put a band together. I wanna play live. Um, and any ideas, guys? And, and everyone, you know, went, yeah, we want in. You know, we've been waiting for you to do this for years. Yeah. And, and that's what happened. And she, she's the catalyst of this. So I, um, I went and did that and, uh, we got a studio and, uh, Robbie Krieger, uh, the guitar player from the doors, we, we, I was in there doing a session in his place and he came over to me with Michael Dumas and he said, uh, Hey man, you know, if you ever want to use the studio, we'd love you, you know, you're one, of, it's a private studio. It's not like a, commercial studio. He says, we'd love you to, you know, use our place. It would be a lot of fun to have you in here. And by the way, you know, I'd like to play on anything that you do, Robbie said. So, so I went, oh, that's cool. So I, we went in, cut tracks and, and spent the next uh, two years recording. I cut 23 tracks and, um, you know, everybody, everybody kind of jumped in on it. And it was, and it was, extraordinarily fun you know yeah and and i want to, i of course want to talk a lot about the the album that you know that's coming out as well but but first i want to kind of i'm really interested in the process for you right having put music on a shelf for so long you know like what was it like for you to come back to Ooh. write songs did you ever just in and in in the time period where you were away did you ever just kind of like did you find yourself itching to write songs at, at all you know i i I, I always had music in me and I always listened to music. I listened to music every single day. I listened in the car. I listened. There was one time for a period of time that I didn't listen to music. I got, I got, it was so sad that I wasn't playing and that I'd, I'd listen to talk radio for like months at a time. And then all of a sudden I'd, I'd say, why am I doing this to myself? You, you know, you, you, you need miracle grow and music is miracle grow on you. You know, you need to, you know, you need to cultivate this garden that you're in. So I went back to music and, and it was, it, it, it was hard at first, but you know, I never, I never try to copy anything per se, you know, whatever, whatever's in me, I let come out. And my whole uh, history of the way I wrote songs was I used to write the music first, then put the lyrics to them. Um, and now, and these days, or the last you know, couple of years, it's lyrics first and then music. And you know, I, I started writing a lot of poetry is what happened, spoken word. And then all of a sudden I went, hey, that's a great little line there. I think that's a hook. I'm gonna use that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
So, so let's go back then, because obviously I want to talk about the 70s and, and everything, but I want to know kind of what, what was your household like growing up? Did you, I mean, were your parents uh, uh, musically inclined? Did they, were they supportive? I had, yeah, I had parents that, that loved merengue, cha-cha, um, you know, mambo. My mother loved Dinah Washington. She loved old blues. She loved, you know, jazz. Not so much rock, but really, you know, really cool standard things that 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 uh, she would play on the on the Victrola. You know, <laughs> she yeah. had she had she had actually seventy eight R RPM records. There was sixteen, thirty three, forty five, and seventy eight, and she actually had Dinah Washington seventy eights and and. Billy Holidays and things like that. So that was really cool, that collection she had. And um, my father, it wasn't very good musically, but he loved to dance, you know, so he would cut a rug with my mom. And the thing is, you know, I was born in New York City, but I was raised in the Caribbean. And in Puerto Rico, there's only Latin rhythms there. And then in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where I spent some time, there's Creole and, it, and it's, it's kind of a, a mashup of, of Latin, French, and a little bit of mento, you know, which is a precursor to reggae. Yeah. And so, uh, so you really, I mean, you enjoyed music from the, the beginning then? Or from, no, from, from the get-go. Yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I loved steel drums. I loved everything. I loved, you know, in Haiti going out and, and dancing in the streets when they, when, when there were festivals and doing rah rah with everybody, yeah, and it was so, like the only, the only white kid amongst five thousand black people, you know, little <laughs> kid, you know, just yeah. But well, you were loving it, and uh, every minute, yeah. So, at what point did you know that it's what you wanted to do? Right? When did you kind of say, "Hey, I, I can, I can do this. This is fun." Well, it's interesting that you asked that question because um, I, I can actually remember the moment. Um, that that it, it it came to pass, you know. Um, I I was working in a place called Manny's Music in New York City, and it was a music store, you know, kind of like a guitar center or someplace like that, you know, Sam Ash or something. And um, a lot of people used to come in there, a lot of famous rock stars and and, and musicians, and buy their things or or get you know get things while they were coming through New York City on tour. And one day I was in there and I was, I was showing somebody some keyboard stuff and, and some guys came over to me and they went, hey, you know, uh, you're pretty good. We're gonna have a jam tonight and you should come down and check it out. And I said, okay, where is it? And they said, well, Fillmore East, which was a big music venue in New York City. And I got a backstage pass and I went down and that night it was the Grateful Dead traffic and hot tuna. And it was unannounced. It wasn't, you know, presented, you know, in the calendar. It was a night off that the theater was open and they all decided to go down there and have a jam. So, um, you know, it was a last minute thing and I went down and uh, I was on the corner of the stage. I had been in the audience before. I went down like as, as, as an audience participant, you know. Um, but this night I'm on the stage and I'm watching the dead play and, and, they're just tearing it up. And um, so all of a sudden, a guy taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, uh, look at the guitar player. His name is Jerry. And Jerry Garcia, right? Yeah. Name yeah. Is Jerry. I'm a kid, right? He right. said, that's, that's Jerry. I think I'm 16 at the time. He says, that, that's Jerry. And um, when he looks at you, go over to the, to the Wurlitzer piano that's sitting there and go out and jam and have some fun. So uh, all of a sudden, you know, about 10 minutes later, he looks over at me and he points and he goes, you, come here. And I almost threw up, I was so scared. Um, but I walked out and I sat down and to this day, I don't know if I played in, in a minor or a major key or whatever, I had no idea. Uh, because dead music is kind of, is really sophisticated music, if you think about it, you know. Uh -huh. It's not just, you know, four chord blues. And uh, 
but I had a great time, you know, and I was sitting there and I realized that this, at that moment, at that moment, I said, this is what I want to do. And I want to, this is my, this is my career. This is my life. This is, I've never felt like this before. This was a, a feeling that would just overcame me. And I got all warm all over and my hair stood up and it was, it was extraordinary. I was, I was touched right then and there. And it happened again, going to hear um, a guy called King Curtis and the Kingpins. Uh, King Curtis was a sax player and he was a musical director at the Apollo Theater. And I, and I lived next door to him and um, for a little while. And, uh, you know, I, I hung out with, uh, with him, with Odetta, with Richie Havens, uh, Milt Jackson from the Modern Jazz Quartet was my other next door neighbor. And I went, you know what? There's, there's the only, the only regret I had was that I wasn't black. That was, that was my only regret because I hung out with a lot of black people in those days. Yeah. And, and, uh, Richie Havens uh, said, okay, you're going to play on my record. And I went in and played on his record. And then I played in his band for a little while. And, um, and then Odetta, I would, sh I would play piano and, and she would sing and she says, all right, now you sing this. And I went, I'm not a singer. She goes, you're going to start singing now. And she, and she kind of gave me vocal lessons. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and then the other, the other time that that happened, and I'll tell you this quickly, because I, and I think it's interesting. Yeah. I, I wanted to become a songwriter, but I didn't know how to become a songwriter. So one night at, at an open mic night in New York City at a place called Dr. Generosities, which was on the corner of 73rd and 2nd, it was, it was a bar, it was a neighborhood bar, a hangout. Mm -hmm. And um, they had an open mic night and a lot of people would come in. It was a big kind of a folky kind of a singer songwriter era in those days. Um, so in walks this guy called Al Bonetta, who I knew, who was a manager. And he walks in with his two artists, one was Steve Goodman and the other one was John Prine. And it was 1971, I believe, and uh, John Prine's album and Steve Goodman's album just have just come out. And they got up on stage to sing a couple of songs, being, at, being open mic. And I was there, and this guy, John Prine, gets up. And he sings a song called Hello In There, and another song called Angel From Montgomery. And then he goes to get off stage, no one will let him get off stage, so he sings another song or two. And I thought to myself, this is so extraordinary. This is not a pop song. This is a real song. This is real, authentic, genuine, right from the heart, out of the mouth song. Yeah. I want to be him. I want to, I want to write songs like him. I want to do what these guys do. And so I started listening really closely to a lot of people that weren't like maybe the most popular, but they had a lot to say in their songwriting. And then I went right to the well and started listening to every Dylan thing I could get my hands on. Cause I realized this is, this is the touchstone. This is the gold, you know, the gold standard. So that's, that's, that's when I, <clears throat> you know, the Fillmore, I decided I wanted to be in this business. And at Dr. Generosities, I decided I wanted to be a singer songwriter. And then it was on. And, and so that show at the Fillmore, did you get to talk to Jerry afterwards or? Uh, you know, like, he, uh, a little bit. He, he came over to me and, and he said, you got a lot of potential. He says, you know, you, you, we had a good time looking at you and you and you follow this if you really like it, you know. And he said, good job, kid. And, he, and that was it. You know, it was like not more than 30 seconds, you know, it was, it was an attaboy on my head, you know. But you had your moment in your soul, so. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And then I realized, you know, like, like music, and this is a funny thing, and, and I, and I think of this to the day, you know, I'm not preaching here, but, you know, but I thought in, in, when I was young, and, and I was a kid, I realized this, that 
maybe I couldn't speak Creole or maybe I couldn't you know, speak French or Patois or, or Spanish that well or whatever, <clears throat> but the common denominator in everybody's language was music. And I realized this very, very young. And that's the thing about the world, you know, nobody, people don't get along, but they all listen to music. And, and I think that's, that's really incredibly important. Yeah. At what point did you pick up the, uh, you know, playing the piano? Was that from childhood? Yeah, that was from childhood. In, in, <clears throat> and I learned, <clears throat> excuse me, I learned, um, I learned how to play from a lady down the street called Mrs. Biddy. And Mrs. Biddy was a piano teacher that didn't read music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but she'd show you where to put your hands and she had a great ear. And, you know, I'd learn a couple of songs like that. And then, uh, then my mom got some uh, cocktail piano player, jazz guy, to come over. And he wanted to teach me the right way. But I liked Mrs. Biddy's way better. You know, he was yeah. more strict. Mrs. Biddy was more fun. And um, <clears throat> the other way I learned how to play was I took the little Victrola, put it on top of the piano, and I'd get an album, a 33 and a third, you know, vinyl. Yeah. And I put it on and I would turn it down from 33 RPMs to 16. Okay. Which was half speed, exactly half speed, you know, 16 and 16 and put on the needle and I would learn to play the tune at half speed, learning it that way. And then, uh, then I could play it and emulate whatever the guy was playing. Yeah. So that's how I learned how to play piano. Gotcha. Well, that's really cool. And, and so, um, so at what point in kind of this process did you become a session recording artist? Like what, what <clears throat> kind of, where did that fit into your timeline? It, it started, it started with, um, it started with Richie Havens really in a way. Um, and I went up to play on his record and, um, he said, okay, so all you have to do is, is when the count, you know, just follow the guys. Here's the charts. Here's the song we're going to play. And I went up there and it was all legends that were on this session. You know, Bernard Purdy, who was like an amazing drummer. I don't know if you know who he is, uh, Bernard. Um, and, uh, you know, Chuck Rainey and, and Cornell Dupree and, and all these cats that were like, the guys, you know? Yeah. And I'm there, this, this pitiful, you know, newbie greenhorn, you know? And, um, I, I, I did okay. I'm on the record. <laughs> I'm on a few tracks of that record. So I'm, I'm okay. And, um, and then, um, I fell in with some musicians that worked at a jingle house and that's how it really started. Um, I started working at a jingle house as, as a demo songwriter for the jingles that they were given. They'd give it be, you know, they were given copy of things to write jingles to from ad agencies. It was, you know, like the days of Mad Men or something. And uh, <clears throat> so I, uh, I go in the studio, they had a little small demo studio and I learned how to play there and I, and I, and I got really good at it. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, hanging out in all the clubs, you know, you start playing with people, you start jamming with people, people ask for your number, you know, you're taking numbers, you're, you're, you know. And um, <clears throat> a couple of guys that were in a band called The Young Rascals, they had a song called Good, Good Lovin' and Groovin' and all that kind of stuff. They were pretty popular at that time. They decided to put another band together and asked me to work with that band with them. And from one thing it led to another, to another, to another, to another, and all of a sudden, I'm getting calls all the time and I'm playing on a lot of records. <clears throat> and so let's talk about um, 79 uh, Sunshine Hotel. Like, tell me about that experience for you. Like, was, uh, how did it come about? And uh, talk to me about the response from, uh, um, from that song. Well, <clears throat> Sunshine Hotel was an offshoot of this band uh, called Bulldog with, with Dino Danelli and Gene Cornish from the Rascals. And there was a guy in the band called Billy Hawker and Billy 
ha had a line, uh, um, I took my baby to the Sunshine Hotel. She said she'd do me and she'd done me well. So I, I went, that's a great line. And I went home and started jamming on that. And I wrote the whole song off that one line. <clears throat> so I thank Billy for the, you know, for the hint. And um, all of a sudden, you know, I did this album, um, Red Hot and Blue, which was the first, I got signed by RCA. First of all, my name at the time was Richard Gerstein, G-E-R-S-T-E-I-N, Gerstein. And that's what's on a lot of those records that I played on, you see Richard Gerstein. And when I was uh, offered record deal, um, RCA said to me, well, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna need to change your name. And I said, well, why? They go, well, if, if you wanna sign with us, you're gonna have to change your name. It's not catchy enough or? Huh? It wasn't catchy enough? It was too Jewish. Yeah, I got it, okay. <laughs> Guy actually said to me, you know, Jews won't sell in the South. I said, really? I said, there's a guy called Springsteen. He, and they said, well, he's not Jewish. <laughs> I said, okay. <Yeah. laughs> so, but they said, have you got any nicknames? I said, yeah, people call me Bear once in a while. And they said, okay, so now you're going to be Richard Bear. And I said, um, how about, and then the guy goes, how about Richard the Bear? I went, Richard, Richard the Bear. I said, how about Richard T. Bear? And they went, okay, that's good. And they said, uh, well, what would T stand for? I said, unlike, let's not make it the, how about Richard T. Trustworthy Bear? Let me sign now, hand me the check. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and so anyway, uh, that meeting, I became Richard T. Bear. And um, they said, okay, uh, we want you to do an album. And, uh, you know, I had a, and a bunch of songs and they said, who do you want to produce it? And I said, the guy that just did Bob Seger's Night Moves, he's the guy I want to produce this. And because I was listening to a band called The Guess Who, a Canadian band, a lot, Burton Cummings. Mm -hmm. And um, I really liked that band and I liked the production on it, on their album all their albums. And it was this one guy called Jack Richardson, who had a studio in Toronto with Bob Ezrin and another guy. So they did all the, you know, like Alice Cooper records and, and all those kind of things. So I got, I got Jack and um, I said, man, if you could make me sound like Bob Seger, or we can do things in that kind of vein, you're my man. So we cut Sunshine Hotel as a rock kind of kind of dance thing but then disco was was full on yeah and and uh the guy that was running the A&R department Warren Schatz decided that Sunshine Hotel should be remixed as a as a disco maxi dance song and it was a good idea on his part <clears throat> because it went to like number four in the world dance charts and um and it was being played in all the all the discos. In fact, RCA had a had a big party one night for their artists. I was invited down to Studio 54. I'd never been there, and um, I got down there, and there was a big line outside the building, you know, and and all these big bouncers and things. And I went to go in, and the guy goes, "Where are you going?" I said, "Well, I'm 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 supposed to be here. There's a party by my label, RCA," and they go. Uh, get in line, kid, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I start hearing through the, through the walls, Sunshine Hotel being played. And so I say to the guy, I said, hey, listen, man, that's my record. And, he, and they're playing my record, and I'm supposed to be in there. And the guy says, uh, yeah, like, it's really your record. I said, yeah, I'm the artist on that. And I start singing along with the record. And it's exactly like the vocal that's going, he goes, all right, get in there then. <laughs> so Sunshine Hotel ended up being, um, you know, a really good, a really good record. Un un unfortunately, it never made it into the into the big charts here in America. Um, but it it's being played to this day in discos around. I, I, I get royalty checks all the time. I mean, it's needle dropped. Everybody, they're doing it in Tel Aviv, in Rome, in 
Paris and Moscow and London. Yeah. You know, all, it, it, for years now, that's 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 been played. Yes. Yeah. And, and sampled. You know, a lot of it sampled. That's pretty cool to have your your mark like that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. It's it's a cool record. Yeah. And so, so I saw the, uh, a clip of you on American Bandstand. Also, uh, oh, tell me about tell me about that experience, like getting to, you know, perform there and uh, meet Dick Clark and everything. Well, you know, yeah, that was the you know that was the gold standard of of the day, and yeah. for years, you know, <clears throat> and he was a nice cat, and uh, and you know he, you know, and and you were you were pushed in the direction that the label wanted you to go. You know, and so, you, you know, they would send you to, all right, you're going to do American Bandstand. All right, you're going to do the so-and-so show. And, and you know, you did it. And, um, you know, I was, um, <laughs> it's only when I got to, it's only when I got to Europe that I, that I, that I got a little kind of uneasy with some of the shows because they, they weren't quite as together or as you would envision, you know. And, yeah. and I always thought, you know, I don't want anybody to see this show, you know, 10 years from now or next week, you know, after, because they've got people dancing around me in, you know, in green hot pants and things. Uh -huh. like that. And even the guys had green hot pants, you know, and, and I'm like trying to sing Sunshine Hotel, you know, with a crew, oh with all this, you know, it was, it was, it was intimidating to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. But American Bandstand was, was, was cool. It was nice. It was good to be on that show. It was good be, because, you know, you got, you know, your family got to see you on TV or something, you know, it made, it made sense. You know, I always wanted my father to appreciate what I was doing. He was a brassiere manufacturer. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And he made, you know, bras and girdles and things. Uh -huh. and, and that's what he did for a living. And he made a good living out of it and never thought that music was going to be a good living for anybody, you know. But it was uh, the night that I came back fr from the road in, I think it was, I want to say 78 or 79. Um, and I was opening for the Doobie Brothers. Doobie Brothers were at the peak of their, their career right then and there. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it was a, a three or 4,000 seater, the, pal, uh, the Palladium in New York. Mm -hmm. I opened yeah. for them. And, uh, you know, my dad went down there and um, he brought some of his friends and he was actually really proud to see me on stage. And, you know, I got an encore and there was a lot of, you know, a lot of good stuff. So from that moment on, it was, it was really cool with him, you know, but it, you know, it's always, it's always the thing you never really know with your parents. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. they have a different idea for, for who they think you are to who you yeah, are. Yeah, trying to lean you in a certain way, don't want you to fail, you know, want you yeah. to music, right? I mean, being such a... I, I could never see myself as making brassiers the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah following the family business. You I, know. Liked un I liked unhooking them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to start there and then work up to, yeah. you know. I was actually, I was actually, a, you know, the only teenager that knew how to unhook a girl's bra strap with one hand. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> I had, you know, I had a whole factory to practice on. You know? Yeah, you're, you, you had some practice. You were skilled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you about a couple of the, uh, you know, the artists that you've worked with too. I mean, you know, like Kiss. Like, tell me about that experience. Like, I mean, that's that's <clears throat> that was that was a really interesting experience, and and I and I owe a lot to a guy called Sean Delaney. Sean Delaney was uh, a, a manage worked at the management company of a coin management, and a coin management um, were the managers of Kiss, and um, I got to know Kiss at the very start of their breakout when they went, you know when when they no longer had to put on their makeup in a station wagon you know they they, they broke <clears throat> and um sean delaney was instrumental in, in kind of making them into cartoon characters that came to life you know he he said you put on the kabuki makeup you put on these these you know platform you know shoes and things like that I never looked at, at KISS as an incredibly great rock band. I looked at KISS as an incredibly great live event. 
you know, and because there was nothing like them. Yeah, and um, they were cartoon characters is really what they were. And it was brilliant on Sean's part because, um, you know, he said, look, let them put on the kabuki makeup and, and, and they'll have a life of this. And I said, well, what do you mean, Sean? And he said, well, listen, nobody knows what they look like underneath that. So they can grow old. They could, they could do this. And he said this in the beginning. Yeah. They, they could be in their 60s. <laughs> and he said it like that. They could be in their 60s or 50s. What did he know, right? And, and, and all you're going to do is you're going to see that, that character. So um, I, I worked over there at uh, Coin Management with Sean and started writing songs with him and Billy Squire was in a, a band called Piper that they managed and, and they had some other bands and um, <clears throat> it was it was interesting and then and then they said to me they said you know we'd like you to work with Peter Chris and with Gene Simmons and do his records and I said okay so they had me ghostwrite with them and a lot of times with a lot of artists that's what I did I, you know, would ghostwrite. And even though my name isn't down there as the author, I would throw them lines. I would throw, I'd say, okay, here's, they come in with a song and I'd go, hey, you know, but you need to strengthen this or this, the, you don't have a bridge or you don't have this or that. And I would throw chords and things in there. Today, you know, <laughs> say a word, you get the third, you know, back, yeah. in, back in those days, it was like, you're getting paid a salary, so they expect that out of you, and you're not getting a piece of the publishing or a piece of the writing. But I worked for 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 Gene, and then Gene said, "Okay, I want to put together a band." And I was playing in this kind of like mafia style session band. You know, it was we we thought we were like 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 gangster musicians. You know, we would play on everybody's thing, and we're it's all for for money. We're mercenaries, and it was. Um, you know, Alan Schwartzberg, who was a, a drummer, and Elliot Randall, who played the solo on Reeling in the Years, and Neil Jason, and, and me. And so we got on a plane with Gene, and um, we were on a Concorde plane. Never been on a, on a Concorde. You know, he took us all on a Concorde, and uh -huh. he's dating Cher at the time. And shares on the plane with us. <clears throat> and we go to England, and we spent uh, the next few weeks you know, recording Gene's album. And then I stayed there for a while and did a few more albums for a few other people and got to meet Cher and we became really good friends. And she asked me for a song for the, an album she was doing at that time. And it came off the uh, album with Sunshine Hotel on it called Love and Pain or, you know, Pain in My Heart. And that became her best ballad of the decade. And so that, that was really good. And so I thank Gene for that. And, you know, Gene has always been really, really nice to me. You know, he's a great businessman. And, um, you know, I, I don't have anything but, but really nice, nice things to say for the coin management and those guys, because they kind of launched me into another, you know, plane of my, of my career. Yeah, yeah. And so I want to ask you about Stephen Stills, because you were roommates with him at one <laughs> uh, point too, right? Yeah, we, we, I lived at Stephen's house for a while. And we wrote a lot together and, and did a lot of things. I played in his band for a while. And then they decided they're going to do an album. They all got together. Um, Cross was having a, 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 you know, kind of a free base problem with cocaine. And so he wasn't there as, as much as the other guys. Um, but uh, we all, uh, you know, we all got together and... Um, and they said, okay, we cut some tracks. We did this and that. We'd like you to play some piano on it. So I walked in um, and I think it was Southern Cross that they first, that I first played on. So it became a big hit for them. Um, and, uh, and Stills and I continued a relationship from that moment on and we wrote things and, and played things, but we were all doing a lot of drugs and a lot of drinking in those days. <clears throat> and I gotta tell you, um, it, was, it was pretty crazy, you know? It's pretty yeah. crazy, yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been on the wagon a long time because of that. Yeah, you've been, you've been <clears throat> I mean, that takes us to kind of an, another part, right? You've been sober forever. 
uh, at this point now. Uh, yeah. I mean, most most of my life, uh, uh, really. And so, like, I mean, and you've also, I mean, been an advocate for other uh, people to do this the same. So tell me kind of about your experience with, with that. Well, um, right after, right after, um, I left stills. Um, I started hanging out with, uh, John Belushi and, uh, and, and playing, um, I played on the blues brothers movie yeah. album and, the, and then I knew John very well and we were doing a lot of cocaine and unfortunately he, he, you know, um, OD'd, <coughs> sorry, I'm kind of dry from this smoke in the air. It's bad. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that kind of set me on a, on a path that I needed to, uh, to go on. And that was hit my bottom. And, um, so I, I hit my bottom. Uh, I got clean and sober February 8, 1983. And, <clears throat> you know, that was a time when it was not hip to get clean and sober. Yeah. Um, it was it was kind of a difficult you know difficult transition going from who you think you are in your mind like this rock star which you're not <clears throat> you know to um, living life on life's terms and so I got I got clean and sober um, I had lost my record deal as a and I got blacklisted, by the way. I, I should mention that. <clears throat> Bob Woodward, who's a you know, famous writer, who right now is, you know, his fame is launched again because of the book on, on Trump. But, um, you know, he called me and he said, I'm doing a book on uh, John Belushi's death. And you were with him that night. And uh, please tell me what was going on and who you were with and what's happening as I want to not paint John into a really bad, you know, picture. So I kind of told him some stuff off the record and, and this and that. And um, even the stuff I told him off the record, he, he printed in a book called Wired. And um, so, you know, I was not painted in a, in a great way in the book Wired when it came out, you know, as a drug, as, as a drug supplying musician, you know, which is, not really what I was, you know, yeah. but, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's the way I was portrayed. <clears throat> and, you know, Wired was a, and the, the death of Belushi was a very big event in, in entertainment. And, um, you know, I was a pariah. I, I was not, I was blacklisted. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get a job. I didn't get any sessions, I, nothing. So I got clean and sober and um, over in Europe, they uh, they really liked me, and a record company over there said, "Hey, you know what? We don't know anything about Wired. We don't know anything about John Belushi. We know that you make good records and you're a good artist. And would you sign with our record company?" And I didn't have anything going on, and this was, I was, you know, I was overboard, you know, in a sea of of what do I do now? And they threw me a life ring. And um, I went, okay, and I moved in my early sobriety. I moved, I think I had 60 days or 90 days of sobriety, and I, and I moved to Hamburg, Germany. Wow. And I lived in Hamburg and made a record and then made another record and then made another record and stayed in Germany for a while. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'd go to, I'd, I'd go into the, you know, into the office and, and, uh, and write and, and, and live there, you know, and it was a very tough existence. I got to tell you, Hamburg's a tough place to, to live. It's always raining and it's always cold. I mean, the summer is two weeks a year and I didn't know anybody really per se, you know, so it was like one or two people. And, um, but I got a record deal and I started back again. I climbed up on the horse and I rode and, um, I came back to the United States and um, I uh, started a, um, a kind of thing with some other guys called the musicians meeting. And we'd have like a meeting. <clears throat> and in AA meetings today, you know, you say your name and your disease, you know, the T-bear, addict, alcoholic. 
And in those meetings, it was like T-Bear, addict, alcohol, keyboard player, you know. No, oh, okay. <clears throat> and which was kind of different because you, so we started this, uh, we started these meetings, these musicians meetings, and it was uh, uh, Joe Farrell, who's passed away, was a, a sax, jazz sax player, and um, Paul Butterfield, the harmonica player, and Ray Sharkey, an actor, and me, and a bunch of other guys, and I, I won't, some of them are, are alive, so I'm not gonna break their anim, anonymity. <clears throat> and, a guy, and a guy called Buddy Arnold, and Buddy Arnold uh, was a sax player and a, and a great uh, proponent of, of helping musicians. So from the musicians' meetings, we started a thing called the Musicians' Picnic. And once a year, we'd have a picnic. And it started with 50 people in a backyard, and it ended up at the 10th annual picnic of 5,000 people wow. in a ranch at, in Malibu with um, Eric Clapton playing and, and being our featured speaker with Dr. John and Chicago and some of the guys from Guns N' Roses and, and, you know, and people like that. And so I was on the board of that for 22 years um, in, in giving back to my community, my community meaning raising enough money to put musicians with no insurance you know, into detox or um, you know, sober living environments. And from that became a thing called MAP, the Musician's Assistance Program. And from the Musician's Assistance Program, after uh, Buddy Arnold passed away, it became Music Cares at the Grammys. So it's now, from, from that little start of the musicians meeting with 12 people, it's now Music Cares, um, which is a charitable arm of the Grammys. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So I, I, like to, I like to feel that I, you know, I have a responsibility and an obligation to my musician for, you know, community and, and to people. And I, I do that. And, you know, because, you know, I, I was, you know, I'd hit my bottom and I had, I had nowhere to go. You know, I wound up in a, in, in, you know, the lowest part of my life is I wound up in a, in a, at Cedar sinai in LA <clears throat> up in their, uh, they didn't even have a detox. They had kind of a, a nut house up there. And I walked into my room and, and I, I didn't have a record deal. I, I my, I didn't have anything going on, you know, I was completely, completely down. And I opened up my, uh, my closet door and right on the door in a magic marker, Keith Moon was here, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's where it was at at that point. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, and I, and I, and I give back to, to music every day, you know, and I, and, um, you know, I, I hope I touched on what, what you think you, you wanted to hear. Oh, that's, I mean, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, like everyone that's impacted, like from obviously you hitting rock bottom to, you know, you being able to rise from that, you know, and, you know, and take your own life back to be able to give back to others. I mean, that's, that's incredible. And I, you know, if I were in a head to potato right now. <laughs> well, that's um, okay. That's okay. You know, um, you know, we all have, we all have, we all come to the crossroads, you know, Robert Johnson came to his crossroads. You know, we all, we all have a crossroad, we, you know, and um, it's, it's what we choose to do in the, at that moment, you know, um, I am, uh, I am, you know, I'm heartbroken by, by suicides and by, by musicians and, and people that I know that have taken their own, you know, their lives and things like that, because, you know, they killed the wrong person, you know, and, and, and one thing I learned was, you know, don't quit five minutes before the miracle. And, um, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, this is, you know, life is not a dress rehearsal. This is it. Yeah. So, you know, if we can learn to live in the, at least for me, I, I learned to live in the now, you know, be the best person I can be right now, live the best life right now. You know, I don't think about tomorrow, the next day. And I don't, you know, close the door on the past, but I don't live in the past. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's important. Uh, I, I think that's really well said too. So, um, so two more things I want to hit on before we wrap. Of course, the, the new album. Let's talk about Fresh Bear Tracks. Uh, so okay. tell me about your process um, getting back in. And obviously, we, I mean, we mentioned Stephen Stills before. You, yeah, you got Mark Froster on there. Um, uh, Tony Brongo produced it, right? So tell, yep. me, tell, me, your, um, tell me about that experience for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Nina kicked me in the ass and she said, go make a record, you know, and um, I, uh, I had a little bit of money that I had saved um, and um, went in and, and asked for help. That's a really important thing. Ask for help, folks. <laughs> yeah. Don't, you know, ask for help. It's, it's a good thing. And, and um, so I talked to Bent Montench from the Heartbreakers and, um, and we talked to Tom Scott and I had this band together with Joe Sublette and Denny Sywell and Lawrence Juber from Wings and, and uh, Edgar Winter and, um, you know, and, and, and a, a ton of other names and, and great players and Walter Trout. I'm, I'm, you know, leaving off a lot, Dean Parks, you know, I'm leaving off a lot of names, but um, Reggie McBride and, 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 um, and like from the Wrecking Crew, Chuck Berghofer on upright bass in his 80s came in and played, you know, and it was beautiful. And, and it all came together and it just, it was so easy and, and, and pretty effortless. And, and um, you know, uh, I'm a pretty good keyboard player, but I, I called on Bentmont to come in and play, play, you know, other keyboards and Hammonds and things. And you, Mike, got, you got Bentmont's number, you call him, right? Like, I mean. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's what we do, you know, we help each other. That's, that's, you know, we're, at, we're the only thing we can, you should be asking yourself these days is how can I help? That's it. You know, not where's mine, how do I get more of mine? And I, I need, I need more, you know, no, it's how can I help? Because if you, if you do that, it, it comes back to you tenfold, you know? Yeah. And so, um, Tony Bronigo, <clears throat> I ran into and I said, Hey, I want to do this record. And he says, it would be an honor and, to do this. And see, the reason is, and I'll tell you the story if you've got a moment. Yeah. And you can edit the stuff, I guess, or whatever you're doing. Um, so back in the day, um, there was an artist called Ricky Lee Jones. And I, know, I don't know if you're really familiar with her or not. But she, she's, she had a, a hit song called Chucky's in Love. And she had this great album called Pirates. And um, Warner's called me and said, hey, you, you know, you're friends with Ricky. Do you, do you know where she is? I said, no, I, I really don't. And they go, we can't find her. And the whole band is in Austin and her tour starts tomorrow. And she's supposed to be there today at, a, at dress rehearsal for the, you know, for the show tomorrow night. And if she doesn't show up, we're going to pull the plug on her, the album, and the tour. And uh, so I asked around and I found out she had a heroin problem. And I found out that she was in Venice at, at her dealer's house. And I went down there the next day and sure enough, she was down there and she was getting high and kind of nodding out and she, the dealer wouldn't let me in the door. And so I managed to break in the door. <laughs> I kicked in the door and, that, and then kicked in the bathroom door and grabbed her. And my friend and I picked her up and put her in a car, took her to Van Nuys airport and Warner's had a Learjet, and we flew to Austin, Texas, and she was about 45 minutes late for the gig that night, but she played the gig, and the tour was on, and Tony Bronigal was the drummer, and Tony Bronigal's first gig, real, professional, big, big gig, and he said to me, he said, you know, if you didn't get Ricky to that show that night, I may be never would ne have never gotten out of Texas or been noticed because he's from Texas. 
And uh, he says, uh, I owe you. So whatever you want to do, I'm going to give it back to you tenfold. So, you know, that's, that's how Tony Bronigle became, became involved in the project. And he and I have become unbelievably close friends at this point. So, we, you know, we did, we did fresh bear tracks um, at Robbie Krieger's and Robbie played on the album as well. And, um, and we also did it at uh, Ultratone with Johnny Lee Shell, where, where uh, a lot of other bands have, have played, uh, you know, Bonnie Raid and Little Feet, a bunch of places. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> we had a really good time. Um, and and uh, the last thing I want to tell you about that album is um, we recorded 23 tracks, 21 originals, two covers, and um, we decided to uh, finish 17 complete. And uh, then we went, we wanted to figure out who, who could mix this. And this is a good little story um, because I'm telling you this because you never know how life is going to play out like, like the Tony Bronicle. Yeah. Well, here's a better one. Tony's having uh, a day out on the links. He's plays golf and he's playing with this guy called Ed Cherney. Ed Cherney being one of the greatest record mixers there is ever in this world. Um, and he's, you know, mixed everybody. I mean, the Stones and Pink Floyd, Willie Nelson, Bonnie Raitt's Nick of Time. I mean, I, I, I can go on and on and on. <clears throat> I mean, amazing stuff. So um, they're playing and, and so Tony says, so Ed, what are you working on? He says, oh, I'm doing Willie Nelson's thing. I got Joe Bonamassa next. And after that, I got so-and-so. And it's, you know, it's a list, a, a list, long as your arm of great, right, people, right. great people. He says, Tony, what are you working on? He says, oh, I just finished Richard T. Bear. We did a, we did an album. It took us two years. We got, we got a bunch of tracks and, and, uh, and it, it's pretty good. And Ed says, Richard T. Bear. Tony says, yeah. He says, I haven't heard that name in a while. Uh, Richard T. Bear from back east? From, yeah, yeah. He says, okay, I want to mix that. And Tony said, well, we can't afford you, Ed. Richard's doing it out of his own pocket. <coughs> Ed says, I don't care what he wants to give me. I'm doing his record. He says, I'll do it for fucking nothing. You know, wow. I mean, you know, I, I'll do it for whatever, he, whatever he's got in his pocket. And, and Tony says, what do you mean, Ed? He says, let me tell you something. When I was nobody back in the day, and I was the assistant to the assistant tape op, well, the only thing they would let me do is push stop or play. They wouldn't even let me push record. You know? Yeah. Richard was doing his album and, and getting ready for the, to do his first album and, and cutting tracks and things. And I worked on that stuff and he was the nicest guy to me. He, as a matter of fact, here's the story. Ed unfortunately passed away a month after Nina passed away from cancer. Oh. And I went to his house and he said, what can I expect? And, and I know you just went through this with Nina, but help me out here, you know, spend some time with me and let me know what, 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 what I should be preparing. And I went to his house and he said, have you had a sandwich? I said, no. Have you, are you hungry? I said, no, not really, Ed. He says, well, have one of Rose's sandwiches. So he yells downstairs, he said, Rose, make a sandwich for, for T-Bear. Mm -hmm. She comes up with a sandwich. He says, have a bite of this sandwich. It's going to be a great sandwich. I said, okay, Ed, I have a bite. I said, great sandwich. Rose makes a great sandwich. He says, we're even. I said, what do you mean we're even? He said, well, remember all those times we, we played when I was first starting and you'd bring in lunch, you know, for everybody in the band? Well, one day... <clears throat> You know, we had all these heroes sandwiches and stuff, and you know I was left out. And you gave me your sandwich. You said, "Ed, this is for you. Have have lunch on me." And you didn't eat a sandwich that day. 
He says, we're now even. Wow, okay. <laughs> wow, that's huge. I, I know, it, it, it doesn't sound like much, no, no, but he remembered it. He but he remembered, he remembered me. He remembered the, the, you know, the stuff. And so we gave him the, we gave him the album, Fresh Bear Tracks. We said, we need 12 of these recorded, we, you know, mixed. And uh, <clears throat> we, um, we got back 17 finished. We, yeah. gave, we wanted 12. He did all 17. And it was probably the last album or, or the next to the last album that he ever did in his life. So wow. it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, it's, and, and I'm, I'm completely honored and, and touched that Ed got to work on it. And um, so this album has so much soul in it and, and, and so much pure love and energy that um, I'm really proud of it. I'm really, really proud of it. I got to tell you. Yeah. When, when do you know when we'll be able to hear it? Um, well, it, it was going to be out on April 19th, which was Nina's birthday, but this COVID thing. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So now it's coming out, in, I think, in, in December. And um, we have a single out now called One Day at a Time, which is all about this COVID thing. Yeah. And, um, and Mark Foster and, and um, a couple of guys from Wings, De uh, Lawrence Juber and Denny Sywell, myself. And um, <clears throat> in October, I believe we're going to release a, the first song off the album because we did One Day at a Time as, as a separate, you know, bonus track. We did yeah. that on, on our own. But, um, the uh, one of the one of the tracks on Fresh Bear Tracks is called "The River of the Resurrection," and um, that's got Edgar Winter playing the solo on it on his on his alto saxophone. Edgar plays with us, and um, it's going to be a follow up to One Day at a Time, and that's going to be out in October. And then the album I think is going to is going to drop in um, December. Well, I really look forward to hearing it. Oh, yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a really good record. It sounds amazing. So yeah, I can't wait for it to <laughs> to yeah. come out. And um, and so the last question I want to leave you with, there, T Bear, is uh, um, you were on an episode of Miami Vice. <laughs> 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 Do tell, tell the tell oh god. So <clears throat> how did that come about? <laughs> Don Johnson, I think, was hanging with me one night, and he said, you know you ought to be on my show. And I said, um, okay, well, what, what, what would I do? He said, well, we'll find something for you. So he said, let me find the right one. So all of a sudden, like a month or two later, I get a call from the production people and they say, well, can you get down to Miami um, next week? We'd like to, we'd like you to be in a, one of our you know, episodes. And I said, okay. So I go down and I show up on set and it's Phil Collins is on is on the is on the episode wow okay yeah. so it's phil collins me um and um edie said no um what's her name um kevin bacon's wife what's her name gosh oh uh, kira knightley no right you no. know that am i wrong uh, no no uh, it's uh no, not kira knightley Ke oh gosh now what i am totally messed that up i'm just having a i'm having a, a senior moment here um yeah yeah you can look it up uh, i'm looking at <laughs> Uh, uh, it is uh, Kira Sedgwick. Come yeah, on. I was right. Kira Sedgwick, you're right. Okay. Yeah. yeah so Kira Sedgwick, uh, and then you know we we all played played actors, and they made me into a helicopter pilot, and and a drug supplying delivering helicopter pilot, and then and then Don said, you know what we're gonna do? It's gonna be really a lot of fun. I said, what? He said, we're gonna kill you. <laughs> so. <laughs> They have somebody come up to the helicopter and machine gun me, you know. He says, what a cool episode to be on. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that was, that's how I got on Miami Vice. Oh, well, that's, that's pretty cool. And you never had an inkling to do a lot of acting outside of that either. Well, you know, you know it, it's a funny thing. Actors want to be musicians. Musicians yeah. want to be actors, you know. And, um, you know, I've been in a few, a few other things. I've been in some indie movies and things like that. 
Tom, yeah. Tom Hulse and things. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm real happy about, about where I'm at, you know. One thing I will tell you is that this COVID event has allowed me the time to reflect from within and be alone and turn off all the voices and everything else. And um, unlike you that has kids and have to go through all that stuff every day, my kids are in their 20s, so they're out of the house. <clears throat> but I've been able to write songs unlike the ones I've ever, ever written. So I have another two albums worth of material that I have written since this thing started. One song that is 18 minutes long. Wow, okay. It's an opus. It's my opera. It's my, you know, and, uh, and all the songs that I've, that I've been writing, all the songs that I've been writing have been to take me out of my condo. <laughs> yeah. It's all out there. You know, they just travel. I, I travel back in time. I, I become, you know, a, a, a deckhand on a, on a clipper in the 1800s. You know, I, I become a kid in 1951 that um, runs away from home from an abusive alcoholic father. His mother's already passed away. <clears throat> and he gets on a train in Homestead, Florida, and winds up in the middle of the state, gets off the train in the morning, and, and it's gray light, you know, very, very dark, and it's just starting to get light, and an elephant walks by, you know, and a, and, and a horse, and a camel, and he looks up, and there's a sign, it says, home, winter home of the greatest show on earth, and he, he lands in Ringling Brothers winter home. And he runs away from home and stays with the surf circus for the rest of his life. So it's a song that starts in 1951 and ends in 2017 on the last day of the circus. Wow. It's 18 minutes long. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been writing, you know, things like that. I, I wrote about J.D. Salinger, the guy that wrote Catcher of the Rye. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote about his life and uh, the song's called The Book of Secrets. And, um, you know, I, so I've, I've, I've gotten some pretty interesting topics and interesting songs for the next album. So yeah. that's, that's, that's what I've been doing. So you're ready for this one to come out already. So <laughs> I'm very ready. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, t -Bear, I want to thank you. I mean, this has been, I mean, an amazing conversation and uh, I really enjoyed learning about your career and, uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you're getting, a, you know, a chance to, to start making music again and that, you know, pushed you to, you know, to do Thank what you. you love, you know, I mean, because that's, Thank you. Thank like you said, you. life's short, you got to live in the now. Live our best life now, right now. Yeah. So do you have a nickname, Steve? Uh, it's Steve. <laughs> 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 I mean, I don't know if any, yeah, I don't have any bear nickname or, any, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's just. Okay. Steve. <laughs> when, I get, when I get to know you better, we'll come up with one for you. Yeah, we'll, yeah. If you have any ideas, I'm open for them. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, listen, man, I had a, I had a, a great time today, and I want to thank you for uh, having me on your show. I'm very grateful for your interest. And uh, I wish you uh, safe time, safe travels, and for you and your family, peace and love, as my buddy Richard says. Richard Starkey, peace and love. Um, well, have a great, have a great day and thank and a great weekend. And, and today is 9-11, so we'll think, we'll give it a moment of silence for the people. And we'll close yes. out with that. Perfect, I love it. <laughs> T-Bear, thank you so much. And, uh, and good luck with the release as well. And hopefully we get some live shows and you can come up to the Bay Area and play, uh, play some shows around here too. I'd love to, I'd love to. All right, see you, Matt. You have a great one, okay? Okay.